couple with uh, residential above. Um, but you see kind of these, these policies and the one that stood out to me is uh, the 380 corridor represents an excellent opportunity to introduce high quality office and being that front door. And we're, we're definitely seeing uh, discussions and more kind of kind of uh, that kind of demand in that area. And so we, we do think uh, once this development moves forward, we're going to quite see uh, a lot of that southwest area of the city start to develop. Um, and the other relevant policies is obviously that maintaining that advantageous property tax situation. Uh, it's always nice to have commercial industrial development to balance our residential development from a tax based perspective. Um, but the other policy is preferred commercial use uh, for the I-380 frontage. Um, and so we, we thought it was a pretty straightforward request. We do think it's uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we do think the proposed use, um, stated use, which is um, kind of medical office, uh, would be compatible with the area. Um, so, and, and I do think that the zoning ordinance is, is well written enough that it, uh, with respect to the design standards, that whatever we see, we're going to see a very high quality development just to the landscaping requirements, the masonry requirements, um, and things like that. Um, so staff recommends the commission accept two listed findings and forward the request uh, for rezoning to the city council with a recommendation for approval. And we did not have any uh, attached conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Is there an applicant's presentation this evening? I do see Ryan Prom and a couple other representatives are here, so. Uh, Sorry, th there is not. Okay, Ryan thank you. Thank you, and, and thanks for being here if we have any questions. Uh, Ryan, were there any other, or were there any public comments for this one? Um, there were not any written letters of objection uh, in favor or against, but I appreciate you mentioned that because I did fail to mention that we did hold a neighborhood meeting, good neighbor meeting as we call it here. Um, we had a handful of people, about, about 10 people attended. I think they were just generally curious about what the development entailed. Um, obviously, no concept plans have been generated, so we weren't able to tell them, but um, mostly adjacent landowners really trying to understand better how this southwest area is, is really going to develop. Um, so um, we, with the future land use map, we have, you know, roads coming from the, from Jones Boulevard and connecting and, and things like that, but we will, and, and what I committed to do with, with some of the landowners around there is, as I learn more, we will certainly forward that information to them and, and allow them to comment before we get site plans. I don't know who's the host of the meeting. I don't know if... Peggy is trying to talk. There we go. Okay. Thank you for muting. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from the commission? I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is I'm looking at the uh, map here. And this is more curiosity. Um, the corporate outlines here, I'm trying to make sense of immediately north of this parcel. Let me share my screen again. So you can see the, oops. So there's a small gap uh, on the north side of this property a uh, 50 foot wide gap. And that is necessary because uh, we need to stay, the county land needs to stay connected to county land. And so you see this in a couple of areas in the city, but we have this, this strip of land uh, here that's in the county. The parcel to the north here is, is in the city. It's currently zoned ID. And then this parcel here, as well as these parcels down here are in the county. Okay, I, I wasn't, yeah, that's why I thought it looked like we have something similar, I think, over on 240th Street, north of town. Yep, exactly. The uh, the quarter moon property, uh, that's kind of a little 
I'll call it a hole in the donut, um, but it, it also has that small strip on, on 240th to try and connect to the county lands. So you're exactly right. Okay. Somehow I missed, I didn't realize we had another situation like that, but okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, my only other clarification was in the uh, application you had proposed zoning, you indicated that the development was for medical offices with the potential for a hospital. That's just the zoning potential, not necessarily their intent. So they have disclosed that this is uh, a Steinler, um, kind of a medical office. Um, uh, they, they would be, as I understand it, relocating uh, from the Iowa City area. And this, this would be kind of their, their office here. Exactly how that style of development happens exactly, but there is the potential for an associated hospital. But there's obviously a lot of steps that need to be, you know, happen before that to happen. And obviously the uh, University of Iowa certificate of need, you know, that being in the news lately, we would expect a similar, you know, process. That's all I have, thank you. Ryan, this is Josie. To go back to that county connection issue, is addressing that just a separate separate issue, like you were just talking the annexation that's separate from this request. Is that something we would see in the coming months then? It is separate. And we spend a fair amount of time, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to fill in. I, I, from my perspective, I would love to infill these county lands and become into the city. But uh, a lot of times it takes a, a willing, you know, property owner, um, there are some rules for annexations, like we can't create islands. So that allows us to sometimes bring into annexations, you know, unwilling property owners that don't want to be mm -hmm. in it. But, uh, you know, we, we do need for the most part, uh, will, you know, willing property owners that are willing to come in. So it's a little, it's, it's I don't want to call it a game, but it's, it's something we look at the map of, you know, if, and for, for instance, the property to the east is, is the rare property, we're expecting that to come in. You know, is there potential for other parcels to come in? But yeah, it's a, it's something we're constantly working on. And and this approving this rezoning, from your perspective, what impact does that have? Little, none, good, bad? No, I, I, I think this is excellent to be honest with you, and and I, I think this has the opportunity to shape kind of the southwest area of our city. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I, I think it has potential to be a game changer for that area. You know, we, we try and fulfill these comprehensive plan objectives, which, you know, I-380 and kind of that area is the front door of North Liberty. Uh, and you start to see kind of the built environment with like the green state, things like that. And I, I think this mm -hmm. has the potential to do that uh, and also attract other development that, you know, we would anticipate, you know, some commercial development at the, you know, at uh, the corner of uh, northwest corner of Kansas and Forever Green. Um, we we've talked to Alan Marks and his team about the Rarick property, about how that developed um, or, or would be developed. Uh, we're very excited about that. And you know, I mean, it's obviously the city made a huge capital investment to put a, a, a sanitary sewer pump station over on the west side. And, you know, it sounds kind of corny, but if you, you build it, they will come. And, you know, this this literally opened up the southwest part of our city and 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 we're seeing people that are anxious to 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 come in the door and develop. So it's it's I I think it's a great, great fit for this area. I, I really kind of think maybe that west side of Kansas is kind of the, maybe that med tech, um, you know, kind of office type use. Again, we got to fight through this post pandemic thing and see what that office environment is. But, but I think the med tech thing has a real potential and uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this to be honest with you. Great, thank you. I don't have I, any further I, questions. I completely agree. I, I think this is a fantastic um, opportunity for the city to have this. And uh, I, I mean, this makes just perfect sense. So this, I think this was the plan all along, so yeah. So, we're approving the zoning change so that they can go through with the land purchase, but if they choose not to, it really opens it up to any sort of office space or like. 
Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, or I, is it any commercial space? No, it would be so. You know, we have a, a list of you know allowable uses in in the district, um, and and it's pretty limited. Um, it's overall it's limited to what I would say contemporary uses are basically office and related type uses. And so if if in the you know unforeseen thing that they they walk away and say we don't want to do this development, you would have a parcel of land that's owned office research parking could be developed in accordance with the use standards as well as the other design standards. And, and keep in mind the way our process works is, you know, any proposed development via site plan is going to come back in front of you guys. So you get another chance to take a look at it. Thanks, Ryan, for answering those questions. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, may I have a motion for our recommendation to city council? Uh, this is Pat, I move the planning uh, commission accept the two listed findings and for the zoning map amendment to the city council with recommendation of for approval. Right, motion by Staber. I'll second Ahern. Second by Ahern. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, roll call. Staber. Aye. Bathke. Aye. Ahern. Aye. Marks. Aye. Pentecost. Aye. Keo. Aye. Heisler. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Moving on to agenda item number four, a request for a zoning map amendment from, hold on, sorry, my agenda went away. Uh, amendment from Highway Commercial District to Highway Commercial District Planned Area Development. Staff presentation. Okay. All right, so this is property, we're probably all familiar with it, south of the, the Tin Roost. Um, and there is a, let me scoot down here. Okay, so this is a kind of a summary of what the request entails. Um, it is a four story, 60 unit residential building. Um, also would have a one story office slash retail. Um, the developer's not quite sure kind of what his tenants are gonna be. So it's kind of listed as office retail. Um, currently, the, 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 it would be a, a newly created lot, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, but it's expanding uh, a commercial lot, which is the adjacent property to the east that has overflow parking on the current parcel and the southern uh, portion of the Tin Roos property and, and combining that to make kind of a reconfigured uh, lot, if you will. Um, as we've seen a couple planned area developments, uh, planned area development district is intended to provide kind of flexibility and innovation uh, that you don't exactly fit into the um, structure of the underlying zoning. Uh, in this case, the C2A zoning, and, and we're very divided on what our uses are with the exception of, I think, one district, uh, that commercial tends to stay in commercial zoning and residential stays in residential zoning. Um, but what happens when you have a residential development that's albeit standalone uh, and a, a commercial uh, a standalone building as well on the same property. Uh, and so the PAD uh, with the submittal of, of uh, a lot of information and detailed site plan uh, allows you to request that. Um, and so uh, so that that's basically the request and the, the purpose for the PAD zoning. Um, and again, underlying zoning doesn't allow residential uh, uses. However, the PAD specifically says that uh, uh, you can you can request the PAD. So, um, from a from an approval standpoint, uh, I just mentioned that because we are as a city by this ordinance uh, are are allowed to you know approve the number of residential units as proposed. I just took this picture in the back uh, this morning, uh, looking over the pond, um, and it just kind of strikes me a little bit as, as being an under, underutilized uh, area of land next to this 
what I would probably say is, and I'm still a newcomer, but probably one of the more iconic areas of our city. Um, it's a beautiful park. Uh, a lot of people use it. Uh, it's a wonderful recreational amenity that has connections to our trail system in the city. Uh, and so, uh, you know, from my perspective in the planning world, uh, you would want to encourage uh, more intense development here because you want to have activity surrounding these places. Uh, here's our zoning map, uh, C2A zoning, and kind of shows you the reconfigured lot. Again, I've got other stuff to go to. Uh, the future land use map is for commercial. And so we have a, we don't have a consistency problem, right? The underlying zoning is C2A, uh, and that is consistent with commercial land use on our map. But again, some of the policies in the comprehensive plan I provided, um, again, the establish and maintain advantageous property tax situation. Um, the one that kind of couple that stood out to me is, you know, support high density and medium density in close proximity to uh, commercial areas and service areas uh, that provide that intensity of buffer uses for uh, low density residential. And that's, that's not something new that's in the planning world, right? Um, you want to push higher density towards our major streets like arterials and collectors and things like that. And as you move away from those areas, uh, typically what happens is you get less dense. Uh, and, and one of the reasons you wanna promote density in those areas as we grow as a city that, that makes uh, mass transit a little bit more viable. Um, so public input, uh, we did send notes to property owners within 200 feet on March 10th, we had a good neighbor meeting. Um, a small part of the notification radius uh, touches the western parcel over here. And so there's 120 units to the west. Uh, so we notified all of those property owners. Uh, we only had a, a small group of people that attended the meeting. Um, in the packet, we had two letters of objection, um, but we had a subsequent one that I sent out this morning, which rescinded an objection and actually uh, wrote in favor. So I provided that to you as well. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of this reconfigured lot. This light blue area um, is the existing lot. Um, and then this is part of the overall tin roost property. And so the idea is to uh, consolidate some of the existing parking on the tin roost um, and create this little over two acre parcel. Uh, one of the design challenges been there's been a stormwater pipe that uh, goes right in the middle of this uh, and empties into uh, the pond here. And so uh, Kevin has spent a, quite a bit of time kind of working with the civil engineer about how to partially relocate this so it moves over here um, and stays out of the way of the building and, and the office. So uh, we've been working through those issues, but that that was a challenge uh, that that we we've, we've worked through. And here's kind of that stormwater pipe that I was talking about. It gets a little tight through here, um, but here's how the property be uh, developed. Here's the four-story commercial building, um, sidewalk connections to the pond back here. Uh, is also a a one-story office building and associated parking uh, in this area. There was a connection over here. Um, so what we're gonna have them do is restore this so that there's not a driveway going out to a walkway. Uh, so they'll get a temporary construction easement. What we have that as part of our conditions to uh, basically restore this so it's not a driveway connection going to nowhere uh, because this overflow parking will be consolidated in the development. Uh, here's a rendering of the uh, property as developed. Um, with the residential property here and, and the one-story office building here, uh, but high amounts of masonry, uh, so it'll fit in nice uh, with the area, uh, kind of fits in nicely with the color of the tin roost, uh, which they're doing. Um, just kind of shows you the uh, site plan, the architectural plan that we provided, but it's a mix of uh, one and bedroom apartments. Um, Okay, so I've been kind of looking at, I know I mentioned at the last meeting, uh, our off-street parking ordinance, and I, I'm, I'm working on amendments to that right now. Um, but in a nutshell, our, our, our off-street parking minimums are, are, are 
felt excessive and, and antiquated. Um, and, and that's why I'm working on it. Um, and I, I just provide a, a bit of background, you know, between the 40s and the, the 70s, the city started to develop these minimum off street parking, um, right? Because we wanted to prevent congestion out in the public street. Uh, and, and we wanted to make sure that other properties were accessible. Um, and, and I just, I go on to state that the purpose of these are minimum parking standards. We don't require, or, or some communities actually gone so far as to provide parking maximums to say, okay, shopping mall or, or Costco or whatever, you, you know, you have a limitation because there's, there's environmental concerns with providing too much pavement. That's more stormwater, that's potential for flooding. And so I just, as I've been looking at this, of, of this amendment, right, I'm, I'm looking at what are our parking, off-street parking minimums. Now, I'm not trying to get it right because a, a one, one fit all, it just doesn't work, right? Uh, and Brandon's on the line, but the Tin Roost is a popular restaurant. Uh, he probably needs to provide more parking than what the minimum is. Uh, but the, you know, small pizza shop across the street or something like that may not be that much. So... I just want to provide some background on where I'm coming from in the next part of my report. Um, but the off-street parking, and I, I think because it was written to be excessive, um, provides for the ability for the code official, which is me, to provide um, waivers uh, to our parking requirements when it's justified. So with this little exercise, I've been kind of trying to look at what our current off-street parking requirements are. And for every single residential multifamily unit, we require 2.2 parking spaces per dwelling unit. This makes sense to me when we're dealing with like a three bedroom apartment, but doesn't make a lot of sense to me when you deal with studio one bedrooms or two bedrooms. Um, we went through a similar, or, or I should say an entire code rewrite in Davenport. Um, I looked at Cedar Rapids. Uh, they adopted an, uh, a complete teardown and rebuild of their code in 2020. And so I just started drawing comparisons of what 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 I would call contemporary, right? I, I think uh, Coralville is still contemplating a rewrite because I looked at theirs and there was a little antiquated. So it's tough to compare that to what you know I think what contemporary standards should be. And so on the left hand side, I've kind of laid out what what the contemplated change that we're looking at, and it falls I think somewhere in between, or or probably closer to Cedar Rapids than it would Davenport. Um, but those kind of give you an idea. And the other challenge that I found is, you know, when you have parking for multi-tenant commercial centers, which is the, the one to the east, um, currently we don't have just a flat parking rate uh, for, the, for the square footage of the area. And what was interesting is that the reason that overflow parking was created on the adjacent lot, I believe what happened was there was proposed in large Indian restaurant that was being proposed. And so it put them in a, a, a parking deficit. And so that additional parking uh, was required on that adjacent lot. I'm unaware of any parking issues that we've ever had over in that area. The difficulty or the challenge for me is if like, let's say you have an office in that commercial development and say a restaurant wants to go in there, I'm, I'm in the potential to deny somebody occupancy because they don't have a minimum number of parking. And I, I'm, I'm gonna advocate in any amendment that you just have a flat rate um, because it takes into account um, shared parking uses, right? You're, somebody has an office and they may leave at five o'clock and then a restaurant user comes in and uses at different hours. And so it, it tends to work from a, a shared parking perspective. And so I've kind of applied what those contemplated changes are to the proposed development. Um, the multi-unit would be 90 spaces, and that's at 1.5 per dwelling units. Uh, they're proposing 100, which is a, a little bit above. Um, and again, the office 4,300 contemplated changes, what I'm looking at for a code minimum is 13, proposed is 22. Um, and there's allowance in the uh, site plan for uh, cross-sharing of parking spaces. And so the Tin Roos property contemplated changes again. This is just what a code minimum we'd be looking at is 41 spaces, proposed 75. Because again, uh, Tin Roos, they know their business model and they're very successful in the city. And so they need to provide additional voluntary be beyond what the code minimum is. And the property to the east that I was talking about, uh, contemplated changes would be 47. They actually have 92. So I'm, I'm very comfortable that um, the 
parking with the property to the east is 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 just fine, um, and I'm I'm confident based on the proposed use uh, that that these parking numbers will work just fine. I think if we were talking about you know three bedroom apartments, we'd be talking about needing a higher parking standard requirement. And so, really doing this analysis, staffs of the opinion that that we would approve less off street parking pursuant to a plan that we've submitted or it's been submitted. All right, so next part of my presentation, I, I really always talk about, right, is it consistent with the comp plan? We've established that because of the underlying zoning is commercial. Um, and so you start to look at this, is it compatible with the area? And so I, I've mentioned the property to the west contains 120 units. Uh, they actually requested a PID, PAD to allow for a three-story building. Um, and so eight of the buildings are 41 feet from grade. Um, two of the buildings are 43 foot for grade. Um, if I recall, this top of the, the parapet was 48 feet. So we're not we're not out of out of we're not incompatible from a development standpoint uh, from adjacent properties um, in the area. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, I mentioned in my staff report the Keystone on Forever Green. Now, granted, that building is is has way more building footprint than this proposed, um, but the top of the flat roof uh, is similar in height to what the proposed development was, and and I just I don't get the sense that the Keystone uh, development is 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 too intense for for North Liberty, if you will. Okay, and I, I've also talked about. Um, this concept of, of an urban node. Um, and I, from a land use, I would say health maybe is the word I would look for. Uh, these tend to be our, our, our healthy areas from a, from a development standpoint. And so this is a thousand feet from the intersection of West Penn and Ranshaw. And it, it shows the amount of development we have, right? The commercial multi-tenant uh, business to the Northeast, pretty healthy. Uh, very healthy development on the southeast, and we've got the rec center here. Uh, we've got restaurants uh, and those things, and so you kind of create this this area where where I think we want to encourage intensity of development in these areas and try and promote residential development because you can have you know this this walkable type areas, which which we don't have a lot in this town, and so. Uh, obviously, being a restaurateur, uh, you know he's got. People here that could walk to his restaurant, or they could walk to the um, uh, rec center, or, or there's other restaurants in the area. I know Brandon's on the line, and I, I know we talked this morning. He's chatted with adjacent property owners, so I'll, I will save that for him. But I, I think we need to start looking at these areas of intersections of arterial collector roads and things like that, and that's where we want uh, more intense development to be located. So I spend. A lot of pages of, of staff report about what the approval standards are. I just go through those one by one in the written report just to show that staffs have the opinion that they meet those standards. Um, 68.12 is the PAD, uh, and the PAD actually compels you to submit a full construction plans, um, which we have been reviewing uh, for some time. And, and of course, the city ordinance design standards, uh, which I think do a great job of, of uh, elevating the design uh, that, that we see in the built environment. And so here are the three findings. Uh, we do believe that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Proposed use of the development would be compatible with the area uh, and that the zoning map achieves consistency with those um, ordinance sections uh, that I just mentioned. And we've got a fair amount of conditions. Um, and I, I don't have to scare anybody. Uh, a lot of these are just minor details. Again, we, we are requiring plans that are essentially at a construction level detail. And so we're, we're almost there. Uh, we've got a few minor details uh, to be provided for. Um, so we will be looking for that uh, before we go to council. Um, and then the rest of these are just kind of those things like uh, the property gets transferred to a new ownership temporary construction easements, again, some, some minor details. Um, ten, and then, oops, there should be just 11. Uh, that's 10 continued. So uh, 11 conditions. And again, these are just 
these are just minor construction plan uh, details and, and kind of things that they need to deliver on. Um, but yeah, that, that uh, sums it up. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate all that. Um, applicant presentation. Hello, everybody. This is Brandon Pratt. I'm the owner of Solomon Holdings, who has a proposed development and uh, part owner of Tinners, the building next door, and also Tinners, the restaurant. So first of all, thanks for your time. And um, I think, Ryan, first of all, thank you. You did an incredible job putting this uh, plan in place. But I just thought I would give you just a quick minute and give you a little bit of my vision. Um, Obviously, coming off of a pandemic, uh, anything we can do to help bolster the restaurant industry is pretty important right now. And um, I went around and talked to all the uh, restaurant operators in the community and and the, the property owners, the adjoining property owners, Jimmy Jacks, that trip center, uh, Great Western Bank, Green State Community Credit Union, um, and really just got a sense to make sure, hey, hey, I'm a partner in this. I already own ground. I'm a community guy. I own the pizza ranch in town. I live in town. My kids go to Penn Elementary. This is where I grew up. I want to make sure I do a project that's the right thing for this community. And um, was met with open arms from everybody. I, uh, I think it's a little bit thinking outside of the box, which is something I do as a developer. It's something I pride myself on, um, trying to get the highest and best use for a piece of ground, especially in a growing community. And uh, very proud of my team and what we put together. But really the whole concept was we wanted to create a place where individuals can live, they can work if they need to work, as we all know that, that with the pandemic, that's, that's the, uh, we actually took some one bedrooms and made more two bedrooms because we wanted to give that opportunity for people that wanted to stay at home and work. Um, wanted to take advantage of the incredible bike trail and the pond and the park area. Also be able to walk to uh, incredible restaurants like Tin Roost and do your banking and um, so on and so forth. So our whole entire idea was to create a to create really a, a development that would allow uh, an individual if they wanted to, to kind of stay, even though North Liberty is not your, your typical big city, we're creating an opportunity where you can live, work and play and really don't have to leave the complex if it's not something you wanted to do. So that was our vision. Um, we're gonna be creating a, you know, the project is gonna be in the upper end. It's gonna be in what uh, those of us in the, the multifamily development call like a four or five star rating. So towards the upper end of the price points, um, looking for a little bit of a unique different tenant. And the reason I bring that up is uh, in all of 2020, uh, there was no new construction in the entire Iowa City area, um, especially in North Liberty that's in that four and five star uh, radius. So that means that there's no new inventory coming online in that area as well in 2021 and 2022. So um, we're pretty excited to, to have a project coming out of the ground and hopefully we'll catch the, the uptick of people looking for that type of property. So that's the quick version. We're doing a few things outside. Uh, we're gonna have an outside area where we'll have some, some fire pits and, and grilling opportunities available, places for uh, community gatherings, um, uh, obviously goal would be to walk over, grab a beer at Tin Roost and some food, and then come back and, and hopefully get to know your neighbors on the outside patio and take advantage of uh, the beautiful view. So that's the quick snapshot. And I'm, I'm certainly open to any questions anybody may have. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate that. Ryan, you had already mentioned the public comment, but I just feel like I have to throw it out there. Were there any added uh, after this morning? Nope, have not got any additional. Okay, great. All right, now it's time for commission questions, uh, comments. I have a comment or question, Ryan. Um, you mentioned kind of the size of um, the Keystone development. How does the amount of parking spaces for this development compare to Keystone, do you know? I don't, to be honest with you. I, I remember in the staff report, there was, okay, so bear with me. In the staff report, there was, I don't remember what the exact ratio was um, because there were three different types of uses in that building, um, but there, there was a waiver of the parking requirements because it was, it was noted in the staff report that you know, individuals that are living here are gonna be driving less likely um, and so I, I don't remember exactly what the ratio was, but there was definitely a waiver um, in the in the forever green approval. So um, knowing that you don't have time to do any sort of research to answer this question, would you say probably this has more parking per unit than Keystone because of that waiver? 
I'd say it's, I think it's close from a, from a, from a ratio standpoint. Okay. I recall that it's being, it's fairly close. Keystone I, frequently um, goes over onto Forever Green and causes issues in the area. And so I'm wondering like if this would be more permanent residents who are more likely to be driving cars, if the change of the parking requirements, I don't know. It, um, I guess it's when a, I saw the rendering, it seemed low for permanent residents, but I don't know. Yes. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a fair question. Um, I, I, I would say that you also have to think about like, you know, we've got, you know, this is this is 60 units, right? And and the, the forever green, I mean, again, I, I tried to match up the footprint and, and this was like a, a third, uh, probably even probably a quarter the size of the footprint. And so I think you got to look at it from that perspective of you know that that you have the the, the one access and and so it, it's likely to going to be back up for that because it is a lot of units and it's it's on a big piece of property too. I actually have one other question, if you don't mind, um, maybe either for Brandon or Ryan. Is that pond is such a um, like gathering area for a lot of the community, and I'm wondering if a property of this size is going to like monopolize the space such that other residents of the community think that it's not available to them anymore. Um, do we like foresee any issue with that, or how like how will this large property take over a public park? You know, I I, I don't. I think it's signed well. Um, there's there's multiple access points. You know, you can you can get to it from Cherry or you know or from the north. And I think even internally uh, through through Brandon's property, even being Tin Roost and this, it's got so many opportunities for for the public to connect and walk through these. And so that's 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 something we spent time on during kind of the initial design talks of making sure we're connecting up all these pedestrian spaces. But I mean, overall, with the exception of this property, you know, it's pretty much built up with the, you know, except for this parcel. Um, and I, I don't get the sense that people have kind of a feeling that, that it's inaccessible for them as a public park. Hey, Ryan, I wanna follow up with that real quick. Um, so that parking lot that's to the, to the, that's, the south of Tin Roost, well, it, it'd really be closest to that multi-tenant unit um, on the what the southeast side of, of where we're talking about here. I mean, a, a while ago, that had actually been signed for you know parking there to then access the pond. Um, I drove by there today; it's no longer signed that way. But I don't know, you know, was was that parking lot put there on that? on that lot originally so that there was parking lot available for public use of the pond. And then how, how is that going to affect, you know, public parking uh, for that pond now? Because if, if you know, if we fill this all in with, with um, you know, parking for uh, the, the apartment complex and, and tin roost and that multi-tenant unit and the the retail that they or the the office building or whatever they else they want to put on there, you know that only now leaves parking along the street on the south there, and is you know how is that going to play into you know access for the public to the pond? Great comment, great question. Um, so you know looking at that development that would be south and east of this, um, there was actually a, a parking agreement in there that that compelled the adjacent property owner from putting this parking lot on the adjacent parcel specifically because there was a restaurant proposed. Um, that was never memorialized through a public easement or anything like that. Uh, I noticed the similar sign. I reached out to our parks director, Guy Goldsmith, and he said, yeah, that, that, that was never intended to be a city parking lot or to provide you know, access to that. I, I think, to be honest with you, I, I think it was a parking lot that was built for, for nothing or, or, or if it provided access to people, that's great. But it, it was in the sense of providing way too much parking for a, a site that didn't need that much parking. And so it's next natural use was just to sign it and say, you know, you, you can park here and enjoy the pond. And so it was, I don't believe it was ever intended to be 
a, a public access, nor does the city, um, you know, state that or, 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 or anything like that. And so um, I'd also mention, I go back to the, the picture I took on Cherry Street. I mean, that that's just kind of the, the wide open access uh, to that park, you know? Um, so I hope I answered your question. You did, and I mean, I, I'm, I, it's, just a, it's just a question that I have, right? It, regarding, you know, public use of that pond, because like, I think it's been stated, I mean, it, it is a it, sort of an iconic area um, and it can get heavy, heavy use at times. You know, if you think that the free fishing weekend when the rec center comes over and provides fishing rods for kids to be able to, uh, to go fishing in the pond, that pond is now stocked with trout for, from, by the DNR. I mean, it, it's, it's heavily used. So, you know, just, I could see the South side there, you know, Cherry street being quite busy, um, at times with, with people trying to park there. Um, but I'm also in agreement that putting an apartment building on that lot and being able to, you know, put some more density there is a great idea. I, I love it. I, I think that's, I think that's fantastic. I just don't know if 60 is the right number or, or yeah, I'm still just wavering on that, but, but I, I absolutely love the idea of being able to put um, apartments there with, uh, with balconies that overlooked the pond. I think that's a great idea. I wasn't able to attend the, the good neighbor meeting, but I did watch the, the replay. Um, and I think most people that were on there were, were sort of also in agreement. I think, you know, I think there was some concern that it might be a little much with with sixty units there, but um, I, yeah, I don't. I, I guess I'm just surprised that you know when the city built that and and, and did all that work that they didn't put in some sort of city parking um, for that. And I don't know. Maybe that was addressed, in, if you know, way before my time. I don't. I don't know, Tracy. If you have That's any input on that, <laughs> you want me to jump in as a yeah. history lesson. Um, that was one of the first projects, and Kevin might speak to it too. Mm -hmm. um, simply, the city wasn't in a place to purchase land to put in parking. Um, and we have the community center about a block away with a um, underpass, so there's no yep. crossing streets um, with lots of parking. Um, so that thought, I don't know if I know the history of the thought process of not doing parking, Kevin, but I know that the city invested a lot of money in this park and trail and all of the features specifically to create a destination space. Um, they had hoped for Tin Roosts and other restaurants to utilize that pond as a focal point and as truly the keystone of our community. Yeah, and if I could add a just a little bit to what Tracy said. Yeah, I'm I'm old enough to remember it. And uh, the the pond was built and designed by the developer, and the thought process back then would be that it would be a walkable amenity. And actually, when the city uh, took over the pond, and then they did a very nice landscape project for that park. Part of that same project was adding trails, including the tunnel under Ranshaw Way, and I guess the thought would be uh, people would park at the rec center and walk over for events and stuff like that. So there, yeah, there's no public parking surrounding the, the pond at all, other than some on-street parking at Cherry. And I think the city also looked at, um, it's probably much more valuable to develop from the tax base perspective versus having it on the public um, being owned by the city and not being on the tax rolls. Tracy and Kevin, that's exactly the kind of stuff I like to hear. Thank you for the, the background in history. My opinion, Brandon, you could not have understated the need for units more. Um, 2020 and construction and the cost of lumber and everything else, there's just literally no inventory on the market right now. So um, I'm really pleased to see this. I do wanna bring up, um, I'm always concerned in thinking about accessibility. Um, are, is this, can you help me either Ryan or Brandon with the plans? I couldn't see any plan for an elevator. Is it 
So is this a four-story walk-up or are there yeah. elevators? Yeah, I can I can jump in. First of all, thank you for that compliment. And I, I didn't touch a whole lot about that, but yeah, the, the market definitely needs more units. That's for sure. And um, to kind of answer one question that was brought up earlier, unfortunately, and you hit it on the head with the cost of construction right now, the only way to get anything to work is with density. We need to go higher. We need to have one foundation, one roof. Um, quite honestly, a pro forma doesn't work with many units less than 60. So um, that, that answers an earlier question. But uh, that being said, yes, uh, we have handicapped units on the lower level. And then we also have an elevator that takes you to all four floors. A um, couple other things we did too. We, again, going back to trying to just tie the building into walkability into the trail, a couple individuals hit on that. And that's super important. We actually have four separate ways to connect to the walking trail. Uh, so you can come up two entrances in the front, you can come out either side, which will get to the walking trails. And then you can also come out an entrance to the rear. So actually it's five technically. So our whole goal was to, to take advantage of that as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, that's thank good you. information too. The The reason I bring up the, the elevator question and I thought with ADA and all of that, uh, uh, it would have elevators. It's because we also have the Johnson County Livable Community is a, a a board here in the area that's always looking at how accessible our housing is for the aging and aging in place. And so there's always tons of information. And if there are almost no units for the general population, units that are accessible get harder and harder as well. So um, I'm just happy to see some more inventory come on the market. And obviously the higher stars, the better it is for our community or tax base. So, um, this is looking great. And I forgot about the underpass under Ranshaw Way, Tracy and Kevin. So that substantially makes a difference to me too, remembering that the walkability. Josie, I'll, I'll also add, you know, I, I build apartments uh, in different areas. And one of the things that we try to do, every one of our one bedroom has a, a basically a shower that would be accessible for the elderly. And then one of our two bathrooms in in the uh, in every apartment will have that as well. So they're not just your typical tubs. Yeah, we want to make sure that we can we can rent to all all individuals. So that's definitely something that's important. Thank you. And we're proud to have you as a partner. Thank you. Brandon, I'm happy to hear about the elevator. I was curious about that as well. So I think that's a really great thing that you've included here in the plan. A uh, couple of questions. So in terms of the parking and, and some of the concerns about parking availability, would you be um, re like in this in the winter, like this last winter that we had with all the snow, would you be removing the snow from the parking lot from the property in the wintertime if that happened again? Or what would be your plan for addressing that situation? Yeah, I mean, I in, in all reality, if we had a winter like we had last winter, I, I had to remove snow from much smaller parking lots. Uh, it's very expensive. It's certainly not a goal, but we need to be able to have as many parking spots available. So, you know, the islands and, and the offsite areas can only take so much snow. So I hope that we don't have to do that because that's a huge expense. But obviously, if that's what we have to do, we certainly will. Okay. And and then, I, yeah, go ahead. I should have mentioned too, um, I, I think Ryan did a really good job, but I just want to kind of come back and, and let everybody know, obviously there will be common ownership between all three parcels, but we will also have a shared parking agreement. So the snow kind of triggered what you were getting at. So percentage of expenses will be allocated based on percentage of ownership. So um, it's not like we're going to have one person doing the snow at Tin Roost and somebody else doing it at the mixed use building or the, and then, you know, having snow not get done all at once, et cetera. So that's all going to be shared and we'll use the same vendors for everything. Do you have a plan for dedicating certain spaces for the tenants versus for the restaurant or is it just kind of first come first serve? Yeah. So we'll, we'll have, I think it's really important to have cross easement parking everywhere. Uh, obviously some of the uses are going to be, you know, the office use is going to be not busy when tenders the business is going to be. Um, so that's, uh, oops, I was getting some feedback there. Um, so, so for sure the cross easement's important, but I would assume obviously we'll have handicap spots uh, at the apartments that'll be designated for that. We have pickup spots and handicap spots designated at both uh, the restaurant and then handicap spots designated at the, the office building. We may require two, like two spaces out front that just says, you know, office tenants only Monday through Friday, eight to five or something along those lines. Okay. And then do you have a plan for, so it's all apartments, they would be generally 
12 month leases? Is that the model that you're looking at for these apartments? Yeah, I don't, I don't see us doing very much short-term leasing. That's not something I'm excited. It's very expensive to, to turn tenants over short-term cleaning, painting, et cetera. So I would assume that our average lease would be 12 months. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't occasionally have a shorter term lease or a longer term lease, but typically 12 months. And I think it's worth noting too, you know, we, we're still working through what exactly the office building is going to look like from a tenant mixture. Um, but I would anticipate that I'll actually put my corporate headquarters there. Um, it just, again, a great use where we're not going to be there when times are busy. So, um, yeah. And I would assume we would take probably 12 to 1800 square feet, something in that range. Okay. That's great. Looks like a great plan to me. So thank, thank you. Hey, Kevin, with the, with the re, um, with moving that storm, uh, sewer, that's then going to end up tying into the pond in a different location? No, uh, we've got an interesting in, uh, uh, arrangement there. Right now there's a 24 inch pipe that goes through uh, two lots and that's the overflow path also for if we have a storm event that's greater than a five year theoretic storm event. So they're putting the building there over the sewer. So what they're gonna do is remove a portion of that 24 inch and route it around this 60 unit building and the proposed office or commercial building to the uh, north. And it'll they're gonna upsize that to a 36 inch pipe and tie back into the 24 inch pipe. So the reason they're putting in a 36 inch pipe is that will be capable of handling the 100 year storm event because um, they wanna minimize the amount, uh, the theoretic amount of times that the water will go overland between the two buildings. So if a pipe plugs, they're also gonna provide calculations showing that the water can flow in between the buildings without flooding the buildings. And that's one of the conditions that we've got on this. We still need to see those, uh, some of those calculations, but uh, yeah, it's gonna route around it and they'll remove part of it and it'll come into the pond the exact same space. Originally they were planning on coming into a different location, but after further review, it's gonna be a lot of work and expensive to redo uh, part of the pond and have another pipe there. <laughs> So that, that was that was my follow up. Yeah, yeah. That, that's where I was going was who, who was going to end up having to put the bill if this was going into the pond in a different location. So right. That, that was right. Fine. All right. Thank you. So I think everyone is in favor of that of this uh, that scenario. Great. Great thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, Brandon, thank you for your presentation. Ryan, you earned your salary with this one. Fantastic work, really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Tracy and Kevin for, uh, for adding some information too. And you know, Grant, you're, you're looking good down there. So, all right, may I have a motion uh, for our recommendation to city council? Uh, Kylie here. I move that the Planning Commission accept the three listed conditions and forward the zoning map amendment with the 11 listed conditions recommended by city staff to the City Council with the recommendation for approval. I will second. Great. Motion by Pentecost, second by Staber. Uh, any other further discussion? Okay. Roll call. Keo. Aye. Bethke? Aye. Ahern? Aye. Heisler? Aye. Staber? Aye. Pentecost? Aye. Marks? Aye. All right. Motion passes. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank Have you. Good evening. Take care. Okay, agenda item number five. May I have a motion to approve the uh, previous minutes? I move to approve the previous minutes. I'll second. 
Motion by Mark, second by Heisler. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hey, any old business? Seeing a head nod there, no. Any new business? I'll just mention uh, we received a uh, site plan in, uh, so that'll be on your next agenda. Uh, I'm still working on that off-street parking ordinance. Um, there's a lot to it, so it, it's there's a lot of review, and and you know we we certainly want to make sure we we get that right the first time. So hopefully I can get that to you uh, at the next meeting. But things are starting to pick up a lot out there, a lot of good conversations, like I said, about that Southwest area uh, and new developments. So speaking with developers, so I think it's it's exciting to kind of view the post post pandemic world, hopefully, uh, and and see things starting to pick up. Hey Ryan, with if we do make a change to um, the parking uh, spaces required, would that allow current um, developments to reduce the size of their parking? Yes. <clears throat> okay. I, 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 oh, okay. Let me let me think about this question. So, when there is a site plan that's approved, um, it, it allows for some minor flexibility on my part to allow some minor changes, and so. I guess in thinking through that, if this was a development that went through the process and, and were approved, uh, it may, if they wanted to make a change, may compel them to go back through the, the, the site plan review process. And so... But they wouldn't by themselves just be able to reduce parking without... Right. Uh, just, because, just because the code has changed doesn't mean that they would necessarily be able to say, ah, we're going to get rid of half of our parking spaces and put up a whatever, right? There, if there's construction or change in the use, then that, that would require a site plan as well. Yeah. Okay. But, but it could open the door to having some, some areas come back to us with a, a change in site plan to reduce size, you know, parking sizes for, for example, maybe, you know, a restaurant wants to reduce parking and, and now have a larger patio or, or put in a patio that wasn't there before or something to that effect. I mean, this, this would then allow that, right? It, those prior developments wouldn't have to stay with the old, the old, um, right. right? Okay. Yeah. And, and I'll, 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 uh, I'll provide one, you know, example is, is, you know, we, we, the Bluebird Cafe, right? It has that <laughs> exactly side. what I was thinking. Of. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> we, we kind of did it as an experiment as, as kind of a, you know, an area for outdoor seating. And, and you know what, that, that plaza did just fine. And, yes, and it so did. I, I look at those areas, are we providing excess parking and for what reason, right? And so so that that kind of gave me some confidence of trying, and I looked at that example and counted, okay, how many parking spaces has remained and, and trying to, to strike that balance, so. Thanks. I had another new business item, Becky or Ryan. Um, we had touched on it before, but I wanted to bring it up formally in the new business to ask if, the council or the, the zoning commission would like information from the Johnson County livable community about um, accessible buildings. That was one thing I was going to have um, either them reach out to, to Ryan and the, the city staff, or would the commission like to learn some about that as well? Ryan, had you thought about that much from last month? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we would absolutely. Um, and if it if it comes to me, that's that's great. But yeah, I, I got I got the sense that there was a lot of uh, a lot of interest in that. I think it would be beneficial for the commission to hear it too, so we can think of questions that we should be asking um, of people when they come forth with a site plan. Uh, so. And even um, for our conversation, what parts of that information are incorporated into our zoning or whatnot or the requirements. But I do know the aging specialist, Jeff Kelbach with Johnson County is willing to come talk to us. So is that something that we could coordinate as an agenda item or does, does that, how does that work? Is it? Yeah, absolutely. Is it on an agenda item? Okay. Yeah, we, we do it as like, you know, a uh, new business toward, toward the end of the meeting, but you know, this is good stuff because as I kind of go through the, the zoning ordinance and try and rewrite it in chunks, right, there's there's going to be things that I'm not thinking about. And so it always helps to hear that perspective of like, oh, we, you know, we need to 
you know, and, and your comment, Josie, about accessibility is you think about trying to make efforts to connect all of these sidewalks so that somebody from the apartment can either, you know, mm -hmm. there's an accessible route to Tin Roost that also goes out to the public sidewalk and, and trying to incorporate that into code writing, I think is really important. Yeah, and, and I'll be honest with all of you guys, I'm not any kind of aging or accessibility specialist. I wanted to help out in Johnson County. And because I was on planning and zoning, they said, yes, we'd love to have you on this. So I was appointed and I have learned so much. So that's why I want to share it with all of you, because even just conversations in the community about wider door frames, because they can fit wheelchairs and like he was saying, lower barrier showers and uh, things like that. So you can age in place. And the fact that the housing inventory is so low and then the accessible housing is even lower. So um, I just want to keep spreading the word. And if you guys are open to it, I'll work with Ryan to get Jeff to come talk to us and share some of that information and the, the websites and they have a monthly newsletter and it's, it's just fantastic community information. And because May is Older Americans Month and the Johnson County Supervisors had a, uh, issued their proclamation at the end of April to also uh, um, associate uh, May is Older Americans Month. So. Thank you. I'll work with Ryan to get that on an agenda. And we haven't done this in a little while now, though time doesn't make sense to me anymore. We have at some point had joint meetings with yep. city council. If this would be a good opportunity, if we're going to have an expert come talk to us, I think it would make sense to see if city council would be interested in having a joint meeting where we all learn or a joint session or something. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but it might be a good opportunity. Yep, I will certainly uh, circle back with Tracy and Ryan and we will we will chat about that. It's a good idea. Great, is there anything else for the meeting this evening? Not seeing anything. Okay, may I have a motion to adjourn? I'll motion to adjourn. I can't second. second myself, but. <laughs> Second here. <laughs> there we go. Motion by Staver, second by Ahern. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thanks, We're adjourned. Thank Have a great you. night. May the fourth be with aye. you.